Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. If you have your Bible, open it please to Colossians chapter 4. Uh, We continue the series of messages tonight entitled Life Lessons from Forgotten Characters. And we're looking at different uh, Bible characters that normally we don't think very much about and maybe we've even forgotten and maybe at times we even struggle to pronounce their names. But uh, tonight we are looking at Epaphras and we're looking at the subject of prayer tonight. And so Colossians chapter 4, I'd like to begin reading in verse 12. I'll just read two verses, verses 12 and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Let me read verse 12 again. Epaphras, who is one of you, A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. You may find this to be interesting, but the city of Colossae is never mentioned in the book of Acts. You can read all 28 chapters of the book of Acts and you'll not find the city of Colossae mentioned even one time. You may also find it to be interesting that Paul was not the one who started the church in Colossae. Sometimes we believe because he wrote the epistle to the Colossians that we just assume that he was the one who started the church in the city of Colossae, but he did not. As a matter of fact, he had never even visited the church in Colossae. He had heard of these believers, but he had never personally met them. Go back to chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, notice he didn't say we've seen it, but he says we've heard of it. We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now here is an unknown church receiving an inspired letter from the Apostle Paul. So how did this church ever get started anyway? Well, most commentators believe that this church was literally the result of Paul's three-year ministry in the city of Ephesus. Paul's ministry in Ephesus was so effective that the believers that were there in Ephesus began to spread the gospel in the regions around them. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, you find these words. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now notice that phrase there in Acts 19 verse 10. All they which dwelt in in Asia. That would certainly include the cities of Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. During Paul's ministry there in Ephesus, at least two men from Colossae were brought to faith in Jesus Christ. Those two men were Epaphras and Philemon. Those two men got saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul when he was in Ephesus. Apparently, Epaphras was one of the key founders of the church in Colossae. Look at chapter 1, verse 7. We'll be looking at a lot of different verses. Colossians 1, verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Epaphras and Philemon were two laymen who had a burden to share the gospel with their family and with their friends back in the city of Colossae. They had gotten saved in Ephesus. 
Paul was influential in sharing the gospel with them. And then now they had a burden to go back to their hometown of Colossae and share that same gospel that Paul had shared with them in Ephesus. Someone has well said, evangelism is one beggar sharing with another beggar where to find bread. (laughs) I like that definition of evangelism. It's one beggar sharing with another beggar where to find bread. I don't know why Epaphras and Philemon went to Ephesus. We, we don't know why they were actually in the city of Ephesus. But I do know this, that God in his sovereignty had them there in order to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to get saved. That is the way God works. Amen. It's just like this morning. That lady was not saved by accident. She was here at Canton Baptist Temple by God's divine sovereignty. God had her here and then she heard the gospel and she was able to be led to Christ by Megan. Well, in the same way, we don't exactly know why Epaphras and Philemon were in Ephesus except for God had them there. God had them there in his sovereignty. He wanted them to be in Ephesus so that they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from the mouth of the apostle Paul and have the opportunity to get saved. God then had them in Ephesus for another reason. And that divine purpose was to go back and to start a local church in their own hometown. Now, please notice that Epaphras was not only committed to evangelism, but he was also committed to discipleship. Go back to our text in Colossians 4 and look again at verse uh, 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, In chapter 1, verse 7, you find the word learned. And that word learned is related to the Greek word disciple. So Epaphras not only believed it was important to share the gospel with somebody and to lead them to Christ, but then he also believed that it was important to disciple them and to teach them the truth of God's word. Now let me camp out here just for a moment and talk about these two very important facets of the Great Commission, and that is evangelism and discipleship. In every local church, there needs to be a balance. There needs to be a balance between evangelism and discipleship. In a lot of churches today, there seems to be one extreme or the other. They're either totally all gun ho about evangelism or they're all gun ho about discipleship. Some churches have a strong emphasis on evangelism and seeing people get saved, but then those people aren't being taught and they're not being uh, fed the meat of God's word. Consequently, you have a church full of what I call spiritual babies. That is spiritually immature believers because there's such an emphasis on seeing people get saved that then there is a lack of discipleship of those new converts. And the result sometimes is that new converts are walking in the front door and just in a matter of time they disappear right out the back door. Then you have churches that have a strong emphasis on the teaching of God's word but no one is ever challenged to get out and win people to Jesus. Uh, We've seen churches like that too across America. You attend their services and you never hear anything about the importance and the urgency of leading people to Christ. Consequently, nobody's getting saved in those churches. Oh, they're getting a lot of Bible knowledge and they're they're growing in their knowledge of, of the things of the Lord, but nobody is getting saved. As someone has well said, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And we don't want to be a museum here at Canton Baptist Temple, right? We want to be a hospital for sinners. We want to have that balance that I'm talking about. The Great Commission has that command to go. We are to go and to win people to Jesus Christ. But it also has, as part of the Great Commission, the idea of teaching. 
And that is teaching them the things of the Lord and grounding them in the truth of God's word. And so we want to be a balanced ministry here. We want to see people getting saved. Amen? We do. We want to see people trusting Christ as their Savior. And we don't give any apology for keeping uh, our thumbs into your spiritual back, telling you, you need to get out and be a witness. You need to give out these invite cards and you need to share Jesus with others that you come in contact with. We want that kind of an emphasis here. But we also want a ministry that teaches the word of God consistently, has discipleship, and helps people grow in their relationship with the Lord. Now, what kind of man was Epaphras? What kind of man was he? Well, Paul emphasizes the fact that Epaphras was, what, a servant of Christ. Notice that in our text, Colossians 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, in other words, he's a a Colossian. He is from the city of Colossae. He's one of you. That's his hometown. And he is a servant of Christ. Now, the word servant is the Greek word doulos. And it is the word used for the lowest slave of that day and time. But please understand that Paul was not using that word as a derogatory term, but rather he was using it, commending Epaphras for being a servant, for being a doulos. I don't remember if it was this past summer. Uh, Was it this past summer, Bruce, out at Camp Chop that they had the doulos written on the back of their t-shirts, all right? So uh, uh, the emphasis was to all of our camp staff, you ought to be a servant this summer. You ought to serve, serve others. And uh, so they had that Greek word, doulos, written on the back of their t-shirts. And you could uh, see them walking around the camp. But here we see that it was not a derogatory term. Now, I'm sure in that culture, nobody wanted to be a doulos. You know, that was the lowest of the low. But whenever you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you want to serve the Lord with all of your heart, suddenly being a doulos is not a bad thing. You say, you know what? I want to be a doulos for Christ. I want to be a a slave. I want to be a servant for Christ. Now, the word servant implies a couple of things to me. Number one, it implies that Epaphras was a humble man. He was a humble man. He must have understood clearly the principle that Christ taught his disciples in Mark chapter 10. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And I want you to read these verses because Epaphras must have clearly understood these uh, teachings of Christ. Mark chapter 10. And let's begin reading in verse uh, 42. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your what? You want to be great? Be a servant. That's what Jesus is saying. Then he goes on, And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, shall be what? Servant of all. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. When you are a servant, you're being just like Jesus. Jesus came into the the world as a servant. He came to minister. He washed the disciples' feet. He served tirelessly from from sunup till sundown constantly meeting the needs of others. That's the way we are supposed to be. And whenever we find this this title here for Epaphras in Colossians 4 verse 12, that he was a servant of Christ, he was a doulos of Christ, it means that he understood very clearly the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is to be a servant And that's what we should be, by the way. Every member here at Canton Baptist Temple ought to have that mindset. When we come into church on Sunday, it should not be the mindset of, what can you do for me? But rather, we ought to walk through these doors and say, what can I do for somebody else today? See, it's a different mindset. You don't come to church thinking about what you can get. You come to church thinking about what you can give. See, there's two different mindsets. We need to have the mindset of Christ, the mindset that Epaphras embraced, and that was he wanted to be known not to be a chief, not to be a lord, not to be a leader, but he wanted to be known to be a servant, a servant. Number two, 
Epaphras devoted his life to meeting the needs of others. After all, that is what a servant does. He was a man who was concerned about others, especially their spiritual condition. For him, life wasn't about himself. It was about others. And he was constantly aware of the needs of those who were around him. And that's why here you find him so concerned about the spiritual well-being of those believers there in Colossae. It says that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He said, we're glad that you got saved. But let me tell you what Epaphras is really concerned about. He is concerned that you grow in your faith. He is concerned about you. So much so that it brings me to my third characteristic of Epaphras. And that is he was committed to prayer. Epaphras was committed to prayer. Now... I want to camp out here and spend the rest of my time here this evening uh, talking about Epaphras and how he was committed to a fervent prayer life. Philemon, verse 23, and I don't know how often you read the book of Philemon, but Philemon, verse 23, certainly implies that Paul and Epaphras spent time together in the same prison. Listen to Philemon, verse 23. There salute thee, Epaphras, my, and notice the word, fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. It's possible that Paul and Epaphras spent time together in prison. You cannot spend time with someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and not see the outstanding characteristics of their life. If you want to get to know somebody better, just take a trip with them, right? Uh, You spend a week with them or uh, spend a couple of weeks with them traveling maybe overseas or somewhere here in the States. And it doesn't take you long before you can clearly identify the outstanding characteristics of that individual. Well, uh, Paul had spent literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a prison with Epaphras. And that's why he says here, he says, let me tell you one thing that I've noticed about Epaphras. He says, if there's one thing that I've noticed, I've noticed that he has an intense prayer life. That's what we see in verse 12. He says, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. And he says, for I bear him record in verse 13. Now, what does Paul mean when he says, for I bear him record? He's saying, I have witnessed this man's prayer life firsthand. He's saying, I've seen it. I've seen it's not a hearsay. It's not, well, somebody told me that uh, he has a strong prayer life or I I heard through the grapevine that he spends a lot of time in prayer. No, he says, for I, the apostle Paul says, I bear record. In other words, I give witness to the fact I have seen it firsthand. I've been in a jail cell with him and I've seen him spend time in prayer for you. Now, notice several things about the prayer life of Epaphras. Three things. If you don't write anything else down, write these three things down, and hopefully we can practice these uh, characteristics of Epaphras' prayer life in our prayer life. Number one, he prayed systematically. He prayed systematically. Notice there again in verse 12, the word always. Paul uses that word always because in his mind, it seemed like every time he turned around, Epaphras was praying. In other words, Epaphras didn't just pray when he felt like it, but he was disciplined in his prayer life. Think about it, because if we waited till we felt like praying, we probably wouldn't pray much at all, right? Um, I don't know if you remember when you were raising your children, but when mine were younger, uh, I remember uh, that my kids didn't feel like doing a lot of the things that I wanted them to do. Uh, Things like taking a bath, take a bath, or go brush your teeth. And five minutes later, hey, go brush your teeth. And five minutes later, hey, have you brushed your teeth yet? And going through that routine and Uh, Sometimes it was a matter of washing their hands. Make sure you wash your hands. And that was a priority to us, but sometimes it wasn't a priority to our kids. (laughs) Why is that? Well, because they weren't disciplined yet in those areas of their life. And that's why we as parents, we we try to teach our children to what? Get into the, the routine. 
to get into the routine of doing these things that are good for them. Well, Epaphras was in the routine. Uh, maybe we could say the habit. He was in the, the habit of praying. And so his prayer life was systematic. It wasn't something that he did just whenever he felt like praying, but he was disciplined in his prayer life. My guess is that he had a set time to pray. Probably he had a set time in the morning. Maybe he had a set time right after lunch. Maybe he had a set time in late afternoon. And then maybe he had another set time later in the evening before he laid his head down for rest. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what his routine was. But I do know this. Paul says this. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Now, my guess is that Epaphras did not pray 24 hours a day, right? Have you ever met anybody that prayed 24 hours a day? I have not, all right? Uh, all of us have different things that we are involved in, right? All throughout the day. But somehow or another, every time Paul seemed to turn his attention over to Epaphras, Epaphras was praying. <laughs> and so the, the one thought that 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 stood out or the characteristic that stood out in Paul's mind about Epaphras was, here's a man that is always spending time in prayer. It was a part of his everyday life and, and Paul couldn't help but notice Epaphras's prayer life. Let me ask you some questions about your prayer life. Is your prayer life sporadic or systematic? Which one? Now you know what sporadic is. Sporadic is hit and miss, right? May happen, may not happen, just off and on, off and on. Is that your prayer life? Or would you say, yes, I have a systematic prayer life? Is there consistency to your prayer life or is it hit and miss at best? Do you regularly converse with God or do you only talk to him in desperate situations? Here's the sad reality. And maybe you don't believe this, but the research has been done, and here are the statistics. The average Christian prays about three to seven minutes a day. That's it. The average Christian in America spends about three to seven minutes a day in prayer. Now, let me take it one level further. That includes even prayer over meals. Now we're really narrowing it down. Most of us like three meals a day, don't we? So now we've narrowed it down. Here, here's the sad reality. Most American Christians don't spend a whole lot of time in prayer, right? That's the conclusion. No wonder 80%, 80% of churches across America have either plateaued or they are in decline. Because churches aren't praying. Dr. Warren Wearsby, I had the opportunity of sitting under some of his preaching and always enjoyed his very, what I call, level-headed, common sense, conservative interpretation of Scripture. He made a very simple and a profound statement. He said this, something happens when God's people begin to pray. I believe that. Something begins to happen. Something will begin to happen in your life when you devote more time to prayer. Something will begin to happen in the life of your family when you as a family begin to devote more time to prayer. Something will begin to happen in our churches when we as members begin to devote large amounts of time to prayer. Now that's what Dr. Warren Wiersbe said. So I came up with sort of the flip side, and that is nothing happens when God's people stop praying. You don't want to see God do anything in your life? Just quit praying. Quit talking to him. Many of us have. Your, your prayer life is sporadic at best, maybe, for some of you. And uh, you touch base with God, but then you're off doing your own thing for a while. And then, then you touch base, say, hey, got to go. It's going to be quick. Now, you know what's on my heart, and we fly on to do whatever we're going to do for the day. You see, our prayer life needs to be not sporadic, but systematic. And we need to spend more than three to seven minutes a day in prayer. I want to challenge you, if you're one of those that falls into that category, if you say, well, let me look back over my last week. How much time a day did I spend in prayer? 
I think you ought to commit yourself to pray more than three to seven minutes a day. Spend time consistently with God in prayer. If I were to ask you, do you believe in the power of prayer? My guess is you would say yes, right? If I were to ask you the question, do you believe that it's important for a Christian to spend time in prayer? Again, I believe that you would say yes. So why don't we spend more time in prayer? Well, I believe when it comes to prayer, our problem is not a head problem, but a heart problem. We know, we know there's power in prayer. We know that prayer is important. We know that we ought to be spending time in prayer. We know all that with our head, but it's a heart problem. And I say that because we are, when we are passionately in love with someone, we want to spend time with them, right? You think about that. When you love your wife, you love your husband, you love your children. Uh, we're going down this week to see uh, Justin graduate from power school in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'll tell you, I've been excited about it. I'm just excited. I'm ready. I haven't been able to talk to him much on the phone because he's spending a lot of time all day uh, working. And, and so why is that? Because I love Justin. See, it, it, when you love someone, you want to spend time with that person. You want to sit down and you want to talk and you want to catch up and what's going on. And it it just seems like before, oh, I guess we've got to go. See, but we don't do that with God. Sometimes we just touch base and, and we're busy and we don't have time and we're, we're doing our thing, but we're not spending time consistently and systematically with him in prayer. Think about it. If we really love the Lord, we'll spend time with the Lord. We can't talk about loving God and sing about loving God and then spend three to seven minutes a day in prayer. That's a rebuke on the American church, right? We talk about how much we love God. When's the last time you spent time talking to God? See, that's what Epaphras, every time Paul looked over, it seemed like Epaphras was spending time again in prayer. Pappy Reveal uh, was known for his prayer life. And uh, I remember having a class with Dr. Fred Affman that knew Pappy Reveal very well there at Bob Jones University. And Dr. Affman told me, he said, you, you really, there was no way to know when Pappy Reveal was talking to you or talking to God, except for whenever he would talk to God, he would take his hat off. <laughs> in respect. So he said when he was talking to you, his hat was on. When he took his hat off, then he was talking to God. And there was that constant communion with God, just almost like it didn't uh, miss a beat. The Apostle Paul is saying here in this verse that he personally witnessed Epaphras' systematic prayer life. And that brings me to number two. Not only did he pray systematically, but he prayed seriously. He prayed seriously. Look again at verse 12. The Bible says, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Now, the two words laboring fervently are actually one word in the Greek. And the Greek word is where we get our English word agonize from. Now think about that word, agonize. It's translated differently in various passages of the New Testament. If you track this same Greek word all through the New Testament, you'll find like in John 18, verse 36, it's translated fight. And in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, it's translated striveth. Um, It's the same Greek word used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, verse 44. And being in and what? Agony, he prayed more earnestly. The idea behind the word is to agonize, to, to wrestle, or to really apply yourself to this matter of prayer. The opposite of this word would be uh, to be flippant in our prayer life. To have a casual, nonchalant attitude toward our prayer life. To to not put any real effort into our prayer life. Most Christians today don't know much about laboring fervently in prayer. Maybe you ask them, do you pray? And they say, oh yeah, I, I pray a little bit. Every now and then I spend time in prayer. Do you pray fervently, laboring fervently? Real prayer is real work. 
That's what I come up with here. Real prayer is real work. And the example of Epaphras here teaches us to put our our heart and our soul into our prayer life. Prayer was not something that Epaphras took lightly. To him, it was very, very serious business. I'm convinced that if members today would uh, pray the kind of uh, a prayer that Epaphras prayed, and that is laboring fervently, God would begin to work in a powerful way in our church. When is the last time you prayed laboring fervently? We do that most of the time whenever we're in a crisis. Whenever we're deep down in that dark valley of life, whenever something uh, gets our attention in life, then suddenly we wake up and we don't do that casual prayer anymore. Suddenly we are getting a hold of the throne of God and we are agonizing and we're wrestling. I remember my mother doing that kind of praying over my brother whenever he was wayward and She didn't know where he was in the United States, and they were missionaries in Japan, and she knew he wasn't living for the Lord, and he was involved in drugs and alcohol and didn't know what state he was in. And, oh, my goodness, I I remember my mother, my mother staying up late praying, my mother getting up early praying, my mother shedding tears over my brother and what was going on in his life. That's the kind of prayer life that we're reading about here with Epaphras. It wasn't some flippant, uh, casual, quick little prayer and then run on and do the things that we have planned for the day. But rather, it seemed like Epaphras was always spending time in prayer, systematic prayer life. And then he took it very seriously. He was laboring fervently. And then number three, I close with this, he prayed specifically. Not only systematically and also seriously, but also specifically. For Epaphras, prayer was not some sort of impersonal religious exercise, but rather it was a time to intercede on behalf of specific people that he knew. And that's why verse 12 says that ye... Now, what's he praying about? What is he praying about? Look at verse 12. That ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So he was praying and he was mentioning certain people by name, praying for them specifically, asking that God would work in their life and that they would spiritually grow. Maybe he knew what they were struggling with. Maybe he knew their family members that needed to get saved. And who knows what all he knew about their lives, but he spent time praying specifically for each one of these believers there in Colossae. He didn't pray around the world for everybody in general and nobody in particular. Have you heard those kind of prayers? I used to laugh. My sister, my sister Pam, she's grown now, married, has three kids. But I remember when she was young, she would pray that way. I pray for all the missionaries around the world. I pray for all the lost people around the world to get saved. I pray for, it was just every, just big sweeping, you know, sweeping statements. Praying for everybody around the world. That was not the way Epaphras prayed. Epaphras prayed specifically. By the way, That's one of the reasons these missionary prayer letters are so important. Because we don't want to just say, well, Lord, you know them, and I just pray for all 170 missionaries. We're supposed to read the prayer letters, pray for them by name. Praying for what they're asking us to pray about. Rejoicing with the victories and the blessings that they're experiencing. Epaphras here was praying for the spiritual maturity of these believers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He wanted them to be spiritually fully developed. One of the greatest problems facing uh, these churches during this day and time was the false doctrine of Gnosticism. And that was a man-made philosophy based upon traditions And no doubt Epaphras was concerned that these young believers not get all wrapped up in that false teaching, but that they stayed true to God and they kept grounded in the faith that had been delivered to them. I'm of the inclination that when Epaphras prayed, he remembered them by name, literally by name, praying for them by their personal name, men and women that he was concerned about. Epaphras was a true prayer warrior. 
But his example of prayer that we read about here in Colossians chapter 4 is not just something for us to study. It's something for us to put to practice. I don't want you to leave here tonight saying, wow, I learned a lot about Epaphras. I had never heard about Epaphras before. Or maybe you say, I haven't thought about Epaphras in a long time. Wow, that was a neat study that Pastor Frazier gave on Epaphras. If that's what you walk away with tonight, then I have failed miserably. (laughs) What I want you to do is walk out these doors saying, what a great example of a prayer warrior. I hope that you were challenged tonight with your own prayer life to be systematic, to spend more than three to seven minutes a day in prayer, to make prayer a serious matter in your life, laboring fervently, and then pray specifically. Pray about the needs. Make a a prayer journal. Spend time praying over all those needs in your prayer journal, mentioning people by name. If you know the challenges that they're going through, if you know the issues that they're dealing with, or if you know the spiritual condition of their life, you can pray for that specifically. May God help us to be prayer warriors here at Canton Baptist Temple. And I believe that if we will devote more time to prayer and we truly learn how to pray, God's going to do some amazing things, not only in our lives personally, but also in our families and in the life of our church. I believe that a church goes forward on its knees. I really do. You and I don't have what it takes to build the ministry of Canton Baptist Temple, but we have to tap into the source of the power. God is the one who can add to his church. God is the one who can solve the problems here at Canton Baptist Temple. God is the one who can provide to meet the needs of our ministry here at Canton Baptist Temple. So prayer connects us with the source of the power. And so I want to encourage you as a member of our church to devote time to prayer. And this week, may we pray like Epaphras. And may we learn the importance of prayer in the Christian life. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to come back and to be with your people, to be in your house, to study your word, and to be challenged with your mission, your mission of reaching people with the gospel and then teaching them the truth of your word, the balance between evangelism and discipleship. God, I pray that tonight we will leave here impressed by the Holy Spirit to devote more time to prayer. Help us, Lord, uh, to say what the disciples said. Teach us to pray. Lord, that's our prayer tonight, that you would teach us how to be more fervent in our prayer life. And God, I pray that we would realize that we are never wasting time when we pray. Some of the most valuable moments of a day is when we come before you into your presence based on the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and we're able to bring all of our needs to the throne of grace and receive help. God, I pray that throughout this upcoming week that you would challenge us with our prayer life. May we remember Colossians 4, verse 12 and 13, and the example that we have with Epaphras. May his example be put to practice in our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.